Hi, I'm Mike Hutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. This module will discuss the use of rumenzin or monenzin in dairy rations. Monenzin is an antibiotic that reduces gram-positive microbes in the rumen. In other words, we will shift the rumen population. Another name for monenzin is rumenzin, which is produced by Elanco or Eli Lilly. This is produced by the bacteria, a strain of Streptococcus. What it does, it shifts the ions across on cell membranes so that it reduces the growth of fiber digesting bacteria because they have to take extra energy to shift these ions on out. What that does is impact the fiber digesting bacteria and end products. So we're actually changing the fermentation profile in the rumen. It also inhibits lactic acid producing bacteria such as Streptococcus, but not lactate utilizers, which means it has a beneficial effect on the lactic acid buildup in the rumen. Take home message, it will impact fiber digestion and sera. Illustrated on this next PowerPoint is the FDA approval process of ionophores in the United States. We will not walk you through these, but you can see that dairy milk cows was approved very late in October 28th of 2004. So this is a relatively new feed additive for lactating dairy cows. Certainly one of the questions would be what functions will rumenzin or monenzin have in dairy cattle? First of all, it will increase energy output per unit of dry matter. A couple reasons for that. First, it increases propionate production, one of the key VFAs in the rumen. And second of all, it reduces methane losses. Methane is that gas that's burped up and, of course, is contributing to the greenhouse effect. Second of all, it reduces protein degradation in the rumen to amino acids, which means we have less ammonia formation and we have more amino acids available for dairy cattle in the form of key amino acids for lactation or other functions. Thirdly, it will reduce lactic acid levels in the rumen a real plus for rumen acidosis. If cattle are on pasture, it will reduce bloat, which is a real advantage. And finally, it will control coccidiosis in calves and heifers and improve their performance as well. Take home message, lots of places for rumenzin in lactating and dairy cow rations, both for the transition cow, the lactating cows, calves and heifers, and even methane digesters. Let's take a quick look at the actual research done with rumenzin, which is characterized on this PowerPoint. You'll notice there are four different levels. In fact, these were the levels approved by FDA or at least studied by FDA in the approval process. So you can see what an impact level has. The first line is dry matter intake. And what's one of the pluses with rumenzin as we decrease dry matter intake? This is also true for beef cattle. Milk yield, you can see, is actually increased. So we end up having kind of a win-win if you look at feed efficiency meaning a slightly more milk with slightly less feed. You can see milk components can change. Notice butter fat drops significantly at the really high levels while milk protein remains very constant. That's what should happen based on rumen fermentations. Quickly, you can see in fat corrected milk, approximately about the same level of milk production because as milk yield goes up, fat test may go down. Remember that a bit for a bit later. Feed efficiency improves from 1.5 to 1.56, even though you can see the improvement on the bottom line, which includes body weight loss and gain, there's further improvement because these cattle also gained weight at the higher levels of monenzin. This PowerPoint is very busy, and we may have to study this on your leisure because it has lots of information. What this has are the various sites that were turned in for approval by FDA of rumenza for lactating cows. So across the bottom, you can see the various states or countries where the studies were conducted, and then the four different levels of monenza that was being fed in those studies. So it's a very busy slide. Take-home messages for me would be that one, a very consistent response, but also a variable response, especially when you look at the impacts it has on milk fat tests. You'll notice those observations on the left side, very little impact. They were the lower starch, higher forage-based diets. So a response will vary from farm to farm, from research location to research location. And that's exactly what this data will illustrate. The good news is, though, very good responses across the board. Let's talk briefly then about the Illinois experience with Monensin. We noticed in our field survey work done back in 2005-2006, about a third of the herds reported a drop in milk fat test. What was interesting to us were, one, Holstein herds that had a high butterfat test, defined as greater than 3.7. We did not see any appreciable change in milk fat test. 
Holstein herds, however, that had a slightly lower butterfat test, 3.5 to 3.6%, had a mixed response, meaning that some herds went up, some herds stayed the same, some actually went down. Interestingly, though, that if a Holstein herd was low testing, below 3.5, the probability of seeing a drop of more than 2 to 4 tenths of a point was fairly realistic. In Jersey herds, we saw lots of differences, in some cases an increase in butterfat test, in some cases drops. So certainly farmers will want to monitor this carefully to see their response based on the level and the rooming conditions on their farms. Another key consideration is economics. One way is to look at the increase in feed efficiency. Based on the FDA approval information, the change in feed efficiency was six hundredths of a point. If we look at the value of one-tenth unit increase in feed efficiency of, say, 20 cents, which is a conservative number, this is an increased value of 12 cents per cow per day. If milk increases one to two pounds per day, but the butterfat does not change, and that's a key point, this could have another 12 to 24 cents per day based on $12 milk. The cost of rumenzin would be 2 to 4 cents per day, depending on markup. Therefore, the benefit to cost ratio can vary from as low as 3 to as high as 12, depending on such things as effects on milk fat changes. A very good benefit to cost ratio. Let's now take a look at the impact of milk yield versus milk fat change using a case study. Here we go. We assume our cow is giving 80 pounds of milk per day with a 3.7 butterfat test. I add rumenzin to the diet and we drop the butterfat test from 3.7 to 3.6. That would end up being a drop of about 8 hundredths of a pound of milk fat. Remember, milk fat has economic value. However, if that cow went up two pounds in milk at the same time, then that two pounds of additional milk also would produce 0.8 hundredths of a pound of milk fat, which means the milk increase negated or removed the cost or drop in milk fat. So the take-home message is that if a herd drops more than about a tenth of a point in milk fat percentage, it may be at a break-even point or may not be economical. Certainly, the value of your milk and milk responses will change our case study. Now let's look at levels of adding monenzin to the lactating dairy cow ration. Due to new FDA changes, there are actually two guidelines. The first one is for TMRs or total mixed rations. So if a herd is truly a TMR, you can add 11 to 22 grams per ton of TMR dry matter. That's the law and that's how it is expressed. Another way to do that is, for example, take the 11 gram level and divide by 2, which means that is 5.5 milligrams per pound of dry matter. So you can see if a cow is eating 50 pounds of dry matter, that will achieve somewhere slightly more than 250 milligrams per cow per day. This is how FDA requires the labeling to be done. The more recent change was in those herds that were component fed, which meant they got grain in the pile, electronic grain feeder, had a bale of hay outside, had some pasture. All these would be component fed cows. And now you can see the guideline is basically on milligrams per day. Personally, I really like that approach because this is what we're looking at, not a, a ton. Most farmers would not consider it that way. This guideline says 185 to 660 milligrams per cow per day. You'll see a bit later that this is the outs, these are very high and low values, respectively. That would be for a lactating cow. For a dry cow, the milligram levels 115 to 410 milligrams for dry cows. We recommend, based on some Canadian research and other sources, to feed somewhere around 250 to 300 milligrams for both dry cows and for lactating cows. For lactating cows, if you feed this level and milk components remain very solid, very strong, you may even want to try try slightly higher levels and allow the herd to titrate the level that would occur out there in the herd. One nice thing with the component fed herd, it does allow you to step up the level of rumenzin in smaller increments. Remember, this is a drug, or I should say an antibiotic, that changes rumen fermentation. Therefore, by slowly increasing it in one-third to one-half level step-ups, you will allow the rumen to adjust to this antibiotic in the feeding program, minimizing some effects on milk fat components. So let's now look at rumenzin levels for also growing animals, another excellent use for ionophores. Here you can see on the chart different ages of animals, stage of development, the weights, the target weights suggested, and the milligrams to be fed. 
We will not walk through all these numbers because you can print this out if you wish or look at the numbers. But you can see as animals get bigger, have more body weight, consume more dry matter, the level of monensin added will increase accordingly. So let's look at some strategies if you consider feeding rumensin. In 2006, about 40% of the dairy lactating cows in the United States were receiving this additive. First, introduce rumenza at the 11 gram per ton level or 185 grams per day in component fed herds. Stay at that level for about two or three weeks before moving up to the next level. Continue to monitor milk components while you're doing this and before you make the next adjustment, assuming butter fat did not change, and also monitor milk yield and watch manure scores. The word is that monensin tends to increase fermentation and reduce acidosis, therefore getting a much more desirable dropping from lactating cows. Next, realize there will be some variation in milk fat tests, and this is common, and this will happen for a number of different reasons. Be sure you watch for this. For example, heat stress will cause a drop in milk fat test. Finally, it may take two to four to five weeks for the cows to totally adjust to the rumensin in the rumen. So when you add it, be sure you allow adequate time for the antibiotic to adjust to the rumen fermentation and conditions and allow the bacteria to shift over and change. So as we finish up this module, what are some of the take-home messages? Number one, the level of rumensin could be very farm specific. Number two, monitor milk fat components and manure as this will be a signal on how economically and effective the product is going to be. Thirdly, the research has a very favorable cost to benefit ratio. And finally, this is a strategic additive that must be used in dry cow and transition cows. This is a must. Second of all, it's a very useful additive because it's a canary in the rumen which means that if your cows send you a message, for example, lower milk fat test is an indication that some other problems occurred in the ration and on the farm. Thanks. Have a great day.